Greetings and welcome to the podcast. My name is Joe Rubenstein and it's a pleasure having you with us now just 75 days from the start of the 2018 baseball season. Coming up later on here in this pilot episode of Bronx Bombers, he's the resident expert at the blog Yanks Go Yard. Mike Calandrillo will be joining us. You'll hear part one of that interview as we talk trades, prospects, and more. Also in this episode, I'll be giving you my take on the hiring of Aaron Boone. And in our Twitter poll this week, you gave us your picks on the greatest baseball movie of the last 40 years. We'll get into that. Plus our mailbag, I'll answer a fascinating question from one of our followers on the home run potential of our new dynamic duo, Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton. And then a flashback to a Yankee great and his legendary season. But before we get to all that, just a few words about who I am and what I'm up to here. So like many of you, I was born into a Yankee family. I've been a fan since I was eight years old back in 1977. My favorite player back then was number 14, Lou Piniella. Great contact hitter. And I've followed the Yankees ever since, but I have no official connection to the club, okay? I'm not a reporter. I'm not going to be breaking stories here. I'm just a musician and producer here in New York, one of many, who happens to be obsessed with the Yankees. So this is really a labor of love by a fan. And I'm a true fanatic, really, of the sport in general. So every week, I'll be here as your Yankee compadre with a perspective on the Bombers, but also a kind of wide-angle view of the league as a whole. So if you're a fan of a different team, especially in the American League, I'll be covering you as well as we move forward into the season and start to scout our opponents here on Bronx Bombers. And don't forget, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, rate and review us, let us know how we're doing, hit us up on Twitter, at Bombers Podcast is the handle, like us on Facebook as well, or if you don't do social media and you prefer email, send your comments and questions to joe at bronxbomberspodcast.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. All right, so let's get you up to date with some of the recent headlines from Mike Moreno. Mike, what do you got? Well, the Yankees this weekend reached one-year agreements with all eight of their arbitration-eligible players. Sonny Gray, Chasen Shreve, D.D. Gregorius, Aaron Hicks, Tommy Canely, Adam Warren, Austin Romine, and Dellen Batances. Shortstop Gregorius agreed to an $8.2 million contract, Sonny Gray $6.5 million, and reliever Dellen Batances signed for $5.1 million. Yankee fans may recall that Batances last year clashed with the front office in arbitration discussions over a difference of $2 million, but this year was comparatively smooth sailing. General Manager Brian Cashman says he and Managing General Partner Hal Steinbrenner remain committed to fielding the payroll under the $197 million luxury tax threshold, which would break a string of 15 consecutive years in which the Yankees paid the tax. What does it all mean? Well, should the Yankees remain under the threshold, the organization's base tax rate would reset from 50% to 20% in 2019, putting the Yankees in excellent position to pursue one or more of next year's free agents, which could include superstars Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, Dallas Keuchel, and Clayton Kershaw. Trade rumors recently have centered mostly around pitchers, although reports indicate that no trades or acquisitions are imminent. We'll have more for you on all the hot stove storylines as they unfold here on Bronx Bombers. And now here's Joe with this week's main thing. So I want to get into this Aaron Boone hiring because there's a lot of heavy weather being made over his lack of experience And I get it. I mean, if you own a business and you're hiring a manager, you know, I'm pretty sure you'd want to see some experience on the resume as far as, you know, managing. Um, But I think what we're seeing here is a sea change in Major League Baseball over the past 10 years or so as far as what the actual responsibilities of a manager really are. Okay, so what do these guys actually do? Do they still write lineup cards? Well, they do, but largely at the instruction of their bosses in the front office. Do they still make pitching changes? Same answer. Do they decide on defensive shifts? No, that's usually decided ahead of time based on information from the team's analytics department. Um, Do they run spring training? Nope, the bench coach does that. Do they schedule batting practice? Bench coach also. Do they call for replay reviews? Yeah, but that's mostly decided by the video coordinator. And many of the classic baseball tactics that managers have decided for decades, uh, the bunt, the hit and run, the steal, many of these tactics are used far less frequently now with the advent of advanced metrics and the reluctance to give away outs. Just parenthetically, I read this stat recently. Last season, teams bunted about once every 320 plate appearances. That's by far the lowest rate since 1920. And attempted steals are down as well, and hit-and-run attempts are down, I think, 23% in the last 10 years. 
So again, what do these guys do? Well, in this new age we find ourselves in, a major league manager is basically going to be judged on three things. Number one, their skill in communicating with their players, which is why so many new managers now are recent former players, with an emphasis on recent. Uh, A.J. Hinch, Dave Roberts, Gabe Kapler, Alex Cora up in Boston, uh, Mickey Calloway with the Mets, Craig Council in Milwaukee. All these guys are former players, all in their 40s, and none of them had any prior managerial experience. So communication skills is one. Number two is they have to be willing and able to work in lockstep with the front office and convey their boss's strategy and the reasoning behind that strategy to the players, which means they have to be conversant with advanced metrics because that's what drives baseball strategy and tactics now. And number three, and this is crucial in New York, um, facility with the media. It's just a huge part of the job now. I mean, in New York and in Boston as well and other cities where there's just a gazillion media outlets, um, dealing with the media is practically a second job in and of itself. So maybe the best way to put it is major league managers today are less CEOs than middle managers, really, between the front office and the players, which demands a totally different skill set than was required of managers in earlier eras, because um, the front offices of major league teams now are huge. I mean, look at any team's media guide nowadays. There's like 40 or 50 people at least in the baseball operation side of things when there used to be like five or 10. So basically what we're into here in today's world of exploding data is really an era of specialization and division of labor just because the oceans of data that need to be acquired, processed, analyzed, and conveyed, it's not manageable by 10 people. And you're dealing with much more than analysis. You've got player acquisitions, arbitration preparation, contract research, um, international operations, scouting. Um, plus, you got team psychologists, you got sleep specialists, trainers, doctors, all that. The list goes on. And it's no accident that you're seeing older managers, you know, grizzled veterans like Dusty Baker, uh, John Farrell, Terry Collins, guys like that are out the door and the younger dudes are on the way in. I mean, a guy like Billy Martin, for example, who I can practically hear him rolling over in his grave as I say these things. A guy like Billy, who I grew up with and loved, almost like this crazy uncle who liked to kick dirt on people. Um, but a guy like Billy, who was nobody's yes man, who was more than willing to pull Reggie Jackson out of right field in Boston for not hustling. And this was on national television. I mean, Billy would have gargled with Drano before he let some GM or anybody else dictate his managing decisions. Billy in no way would be able to manage in today's game. There's no way. Um, which is not to say he wasn't a great manager or cutting edge in his own time. In fact, one recent development he sort of pioneered, at least in part, is the rise of the bench coach position. Um, in 1976, he started using Yogi Berra in that role because Yogi was a good communicator and Billy wasn't. Or he was with certain players like Munson and Pinella, Nettles, guys like him basically, hard-nosed grinders. But the Reggie Jacksons of the world, not so much. But anyway, now every team has a bench coach and it's an important position. Honestly, it's not so far in importance behind the manager himself. But getting back to managers, if you want a perfect example of the transformation I've been talking about, just look at the last World Series. You had A.J. Hinch, 43, on one side, and Dave Roberts, 45, on the other. Both hired with very little experience, uh, players managers, very personable, media friendly, and very comfortable with analytics. Now, you might hear the three traits that I listed before and say, well, didn't Joe Girardi check all those boxes? Well, it turns out the answer is no. I mean, yes, he was committed to analytics and he believed in that, but from what I've read, and I have no inside knowledge, I read all the same reports and blogs that you guys do, but the word is that he bristled at times when given input from the front office. Although I gotta say, in his defense, uh, as far as that Chris Carter situation where Cashman wanted to play Carter more at DH and Girardi didn't, that was one area where I had to agree with Girardi. I mean, Carter was a fiasco at that position. He was giving us nothing. And now we have Stanton. I mean, what an upgrade. But anyway, Girardi was also not a great communicator um, with his players or the media. Um, this is what's being reported. And, and again, based on everything that I've read, he has a personality that's fueled by tension. And maybe that wore people down, including himself, and created unnecessary friction, maybe even some enemies he didn't need to make. And so it was time for a change. So then the question becomes, how much does a manager actually matter? Um, and it's tough to answer. I mean, everybody knows there's been bad managers that have won World Series, okay? Um, Bob Brenly comes to mind. And there have been very talented managers who have not. I think of someone like Buck Showalter. And everybody's favorite stat, uh, wins above replacement, 
can't really be applied to managers the way it can to players. Managers, for the most part, don't really do the kinds of things that could be analyzed that way because the success or failure of their in-game decisions uh, aren't really reliant on their abilities as much as on the players. So you could look at one loss record, but how many wins and losses can you directly attribute to a manager? Again, it's not answerable. I mean, you could almost make the argument that clubhouse chemistry is a better gauge of a manager's ability than winning percentage. And by the way, I think clubhouse chemistry, or lack thereof, had a lot to do with why John Farrell, who won you know division titles in Boston and a World Series, is out of a job. Now, as far as Aaron Boone, given what I've been saying, I think this hire actually makes a lot of sense. First of all, his media skills. I mean, I hate ESPN baseball telecasts with a passion. They are completely overproduced. And whoever dreamed up that digital strike zone graphic they leave up there in front of the catcher for the entire game is an agent of Satan. But I thought Boone did a really good job in his role there at ESPN. And apparently he used that opportunity over a period of nine years, nine crucial years in the evolution of baseball to take a peek behind the scenes at pretty much all 30 teams and pick the brains of those who run them. And according to Joel Sherman of The Post, his interviewers for the Yankee job, including Brian Cashman, were totally floored by the depth of his grasp on the modern game, including analytics. So another argument that could be made for Boone is, you know, that sort of reconnaissance mission he went on while he was at ESPN, gathering intel on how teams are run nowadays, that that experience may have been more valuable than, say, 10 years managing single A somewhere um, that would have looked good on a resume, but maybe would have had fewer practical applications in today's major league game. And oh, by the way, for all you Boone skeptics, if nothing I've said has convinced you, how about the bonus of Red Sox fans having to be forcibly reminded every time we play them of that home run off Wakefield that won the ALCS in 2003? I mean, how does that grab you? And just two final points on this whole experience issue. Number one, uh, in 1998, George Steinbrenner hired a 30-year-old kid named Brian Cashman as GM. How'd that work out? Um, and number two, pitching coach Larry Rothschild Probably the second most important guy in the dugout. Um, He is sticking around, so we'll have some continuity and experience there. But I got to be honest, the more I've thought about this, uh, the more it makes sense to me. So I, for one, welcome Booney back to the Bronx with open arms. I think he's a good guy, and let's hope that once, maybe more than once, he gets to take that ride along the Canyon of Heroes. Back in a moment. Bronx Bombers Trivia. Whose errant throw did Derek Jeter save on the famous flip play in the 2001 Division Series against the Oakland A's? Was it A, Paul O'Neill, B, Shane Spencer, C, Gerald Williams, or D, David Justice? The answer coming up a little bit later in the podcast. Our guest this week on Bronx Bombers probably needs no introduction if you spent more than, I don't know, five minutes in the world of Yankee blogs. He's the resident expert at the Yanks Go Yard blog, which is part of the fan-sided network. I'm a daily reader myself. They cover the team extensively. I mean, if you do a Google search for Yankee news, chances are you'll find a brand new piece from Yanks Go Yard, usually written by the man who joins us now, Mike Calandrillo. And Mike, it's an honor to have you here with us on the podcast, brother. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you for having me, Joe. It's a real pleasure. I uh, love what you're doing here and, uh, you know, much, much success to you in, in the future. I appreciate that. Now, before we dive into the Yankees, and there's a lot to talk about, let's talk about you for a second. I'm curious, when did your passion for the Yankees begin? How did you start writing about them? And then what's your day job? Tell the listeners a little about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I come from a long line of baseball players. Uh, My grandfather played for the Brooklyn Dodgers organization before World War II. My dad played for the Pirates organization back in the late 60s. I myself played high school and a little bit of college ball. So just grew up around it, loved every minute of it. You know, when I was a kid, we grew up in New York. Um, I was a fan more of players more than more than a specific team. You know, these were the early uh, early 90s, late 80s. The Yankees were pretty irrelevant. Uh, you know, the Mets were going through, you know, a little bit of struggles after their big 86 run and back in 88. So I rooted for the guys like Cal Ripken, Frank Thomas, Ken Griffey Jr. I, you know, I didn't so much have an identity, but uh, we moved to uh, South Florida in 1994. And, uh, you know, this was about the time of the Braves, you know, the Braves dynasty. Everybody in Florida was a Braves fan because, you know, the Marlins had just started a year before. They were still trying to figure themselves out. And uh, as it so happened, my family and I went to a mall one night, walked into a Champ Sporting Goods store, and on a clearance rack was this beautiful navy blue and, and red Yankee sweatshirt. It was just meant to be. I immediately just found an identity. I was a 
transplanting New Yorker. I couldn't associate with the Braves. That They just weren't who I was. That night, my dad bought me my first Yankees fitted cap. And since 1994, even though it was a, a strike shortened season, I've been in love with everything Yankees. Now, one of many things Sabermetrics has changed is the way batting orders are constructed. Guys that would have hit cleanup 20 years ago are now hitting third or second. So how would manager Mike Calandrillo fill out the lineup card on opening day in Toronto? And we'll assume for the sake of this hypothetical that Torres is starting at second base and Miguel Andujar is at third. Okay. Uh, probably make a lot of people angry, but, uh, but that's what I do. Uh, you got to go with Guardy leading off. Uh, he's our leader. If you watched him in the postseason, the way he just fought off pitches, uh, I mean, it was amazing. It was it was honestly a thing of beauty to watch him fight Andrew Miller 12, 13 pitches in that ALDS. So you go Guardy because he's one of the few guys that actually looks to get on base however you have to. Walks, getting hit by a pitch. Um, and then I'm going Aaron Hicks. I'm going Aaron Hicks, too. I know everybody and their mother wants to go Aaron Judge. But Aaron Hicks, he's a switch hitter, okay? It's a huge thing when you've got a left-handed pitcher on the mound or a late-game late, late game situation where they're going to mix and match in the bullpen. And the thing I like about Hicks is not only can he steal bases, but he's got the ability to drive the ball the opposite way. And again, I know we're never going to have another Derek Jeter who made a living of hitting inside out to right field. But, you know, Hicks is a guy that if he gets on base, he's, he's gonna he can make things happen as well if Guardy doesn't get on. And to me, that's important. Third, I'm going Judge. Uh, I know third is usually reserved for your best overall hitter. And we still, you know, even though Judge hit, you know, 52 home runs, he's got he's got a hole in his swing that he needs to work on. And I'm sure he will. But I, I don't want him second. I want him in an RBI spot. I want him if he's going to swing downtown, then that's what he's going to do. I don't want him even thinking about advancing runners because that's that's not what he's the cover of, you know, video games and, and, and endorsement deals for. For Fourth is, is Stanton. I know it's two righties back to back, but really, where are you going to bat Stanton? I mean, people will argue he'll bat third, but it's it's Giancarlo Stanton, man. I mean, if you've got Judge three, you're not pitching around him because you're not pitching around Giancarlo Stanton. I mean, it's just I'm still amazed that this that it's even a reality that we're talking about him in the lineup, but we are. Uh, I'm going DD five for now, just because I do want to break it up a little bit. I love the fact that DD has really his power has come just every year. He just continues to evolve into a really consistent all-around good hitter now he could bat second in my lineup depending on the days depending on the matchup because again he's a guy that doesn't necessarily have to pull the ball every time he's got pretty good speed he gets on base you know a fairly consistent amount of time but for this experiment i'm going five which means i'm going gary sanchez six going back to the righty i want to take as much pressure off of sanchez as i possibly can he wore down a lot last year we all know about the deal with him and the old manager uh keeping him six keeping him a little bit more fresh when he goes bad he goes really bad so i want to i want a little bit more focus on his catching this year uh throwing out runners like we know he can blocking balls like he has to and and i think the offense will come you know naturally the way it has what that does it puts bird at seven this is the wild card uh ideally in, in an ideal world Greg Bird is batting fourth in between, you know, the big boppers, even if that means I have to put Stanton fifth. But Bird's going to have to earn it. He's going to have to stay healthy, which he hasn't shown us any reason he can. And I've got a lot of flack over writing an article this week that said, well, this to me, this is Bird's last year. This is make or break. He's 25. How many more years are we even keep saying this is his breakout year? This is no Nick Johnson would had a breakout never. And neither did Kevin Moss. And it goes back further and further that I know that he's got all the tools Wait, no, he doesn't, guys. He's a power hitter. He can't run. He can't throw. And he's a first baseman. His glove is not Mark Teixeira. So if he doesn't hit, he doesn't bring a whole lot of value. So that's what really needs to be uh, kind of reflected on. But again, I'm rooting for him. I want him to be the guy because he's 25 and he does have great pop. And again, we were, you know, not as many left-handed bats in the lineup as we might like. I'm going with Andrew Har eighth because again, man, the guy just flat out rakes. If anybody remembers that July game in, in Chicago, he just hits. It's like it's like Adrian Beltre met Vladimir Guerrero. The guy, he'll just he'll hit anything. Uh, it doesn't strike out a whole lot too, which is what I love. And of course, ninth, you're gonna have that. You're gonna have that scrappy second baseman, Tyler Wade. I love what he brings defensively. You super utility guy can play all positions. Batted over 310 as a career minor leaguer. But Therese is gonna be the guy. Uh, you can definitely mix and match depending on you know uh, the splits. Uh, but we'll go Therese. He just does the job. I don't like him as an everyday guy because he's gonna wear down, which he did two years ago. You you know, when when uh, when Chase Headley was out and he played third base for about six weeks. So putting him in spurts is definitely the way to go. But yeah, that's my lineup. And uh, hopefully uh, Booney's listening and take some advice. Mike Calandrillo from YanksGoYard.com is our guest this week on the Bronx Bombers podcast. Okay, so on the trade front, 
and the free agent front. Obviously, a lot of unsigned free agents out there, and three positional spots the Yankees might be looking to fill would be a veteran third baseman, an additional starting pitcher, and maybe a second baseman, although personally, I think we're kind of set at second with Torres and Wade to start the season and then Gleyber Torres in May. But you floated ideas for some potential packages that would include Dellen Batances plus prospects in exchange for some players from the Cubs, some other options as well. So looking around... Who would you be most excited about acquiring right now in exchange for a package that included some prospects and say either Batansis or maybe even Gardner and his $11.5 million contract, since I'm assuming Ellsbury can't be moved at this point? Yeah, we're definitely uh, hamstrung with that one. And and the matter, the fact of the matter with Ellsbury, it comes out, you know, the news comes out and says, well, now the Yankees are willing to eat half his contract. Great. Well, who's going to pick up the other half? Because that's what we got to figure out. But uh, besides from that, working around it, I would love to see them trade Dylan Batances. I know he's been an all-star for four years. I know that he, when he's on, he's great. But as he proved two years ago, he doesn't have that closer mentality. Maybe he would in, in Seattle. Who knows? Wherever. Maybe with the Cubs. And that's why I floated that idea that the Yankees, we have an abundance of riches. As, as you saw the recent news, Tommy Conley signs a $1.3 million deal to avoid arbitration. So as effective and as important as as Canley was when he came from the White Sox, and we know the issues that that Levine had last year with Dellen going to arbitration, how much money is this guy going to want this year? Because I guarantee he's going to want, if not the same, was it three and a half million? He's going to want more, probably closer to five, even though he had a very, I know he made the All-Star team again, but I know it was a down year, especially in the postseason where Joe Girardi couldn't even go to him. Uh, so I'm sending him personally. I'm sending him to Chicago. I know it's not going to be enough because of the year that he came off of. Have we traded him two years ago? Done deal. Probably could go straight up. But I'm looking for I'm looking for that linchpin. Who knows what's going to happen with Manny Machado a year from now? He could resign in Baltimore. He could go to wherever the most amount of money is. Don't be surprised any one of the the LA teams come into it. Um, but I'm trading Batantis in a package. Maybe if you have to throw in somebody like a Chance Adams, and if you have to throw in uh, Clint Frazier, I'm asking for Javi Baez. I know that the Cubs fans, they gave me a lot of crap for it on Twitter, think he has the best glove in the National League. I understand that. But he still doesn't have an everyday position. I know Ben Zobris is getting up there in age. His stats are down, but Joe Madden loves veterans. So whether or not Baez is going to play every day, it remains to be seen. Hey, look, he can play third, short, second. He can play almost every outfield position. On the Yankees, that's a big plus. But for me, I'm sticking him at third base. I know that may make Andujar, Miguel Andujar, who's a number five prospect, expendable. So be it. If the Cubs even ask for him... I would potentially think about it, not that there's a need for them at third base with Chris Bryant, but a guy like Javi Baez, who's only 23 years old and is just a, just coming into his own, needs to play every day. If you can put him at third or second, and you've got Glaber Torres sometime this year, hopefully, you are so strong with, with Didi at short and hopefully Greg Bird at first and Sanchez behind the plate. That is an infield that can carry this team for at least the next 10 years and, and hopefully more. So a player like that is something that if you're going to trade Batances because there is still so much upside it's still only 29 years old I'm doing now if they don't want to trade bias I also really like the kid Ian Happ Ian Happ's a second baseman uh, by trade he also can play any outfield position and he's a left-handed stick which as we know in Yankee Stadium goes a long way so where is Happ going to play nobody knows because Schwarber's back and left you've still got that giant contract in right field with Jason Hayward there is talk about Almora and center maybe could be Hap. Hap played a lot there last year, and there's always that rumor, always that rumor about Bryce Harper going to Chicago next year with his good friend from high school, Chris Bryant. So again, if that happens, where does Hap go? So I think if they actually ask for Hap, you might be able to get Batances and one other piece instead of having to shell out a little bit more for Javi Baez because he is a bit more of a proven commodity. Uh, as far as the other positions you were talking about, everybody wants Todd Frazier back. I get that. But doing the math last week in one of the articles I wrote, it's about $19 million left. Uh, so you're going to have to come to a choice. Who's it going to be? Is it going to be him? Is it going to be a starting pitcher keep uh, keeping a link to you darvish i don't know it's hard to say the guy was estimated to make 160 million dollars by mlb trade rumors uh it back in october so i don't know his price is falling that much but look i'm really surprised certain guys are still on the free agent market him i'm, I'm shocked eric hosmer although i think he'll end up going back to kansas city because they have to re-sign him he is the face now i would love love mike moustakas on a one-year deal you keep anderhar in the minors you can keep glaber down in the minors as well you get that extra 
extra year of service time and you don't need to rush him because again he only had a handful of plate appearances before he got hurt last year at AAA it might be a pipe dream but but if this goes on a little bit longer and we creep into February and we're getting real close to pitchers and catchers reporting maybe Boris bites the bullet and he he accepts a one year deal because I guarantee if you put Mike you put Mike Moustakas in third base in Yankee Stadium the guy's going to have a better year than he had last year and we're talking him in between Oh, man, uh, Giancarlo Stanton and Aaron, I mean, the possibilities are endless. So I would love that. And the last piece to the puzzle, which isn't a deal breaker for me, is a left-handed reliever. I know we got Chase and Shreve. I know he looked better at times last year, but I still, every time he comes out of the bullpen, I'm waiting for him to implode. Uh, I would love a guy like Tony Watson. He's got a lot of experience. He looked great for the Dodgers in the postseason run, and the Dodgers really can't afford to lose him because besides from Kenley Jansen, there's not much else there. But, you know, it's all going to depend on, on what – what that extra piece is going to be, as as Brian Cashman said, maybe there's one more move left to be made. Maybe it's a big one. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a guy like Mark Reynolds that I'm a fan of that you can stick at third. You can stick at first if Greg Bird gets hurt once again or struggles like he's known to. Uh, and we've already seen Reynolds play with the Yankees. He played pretty well. He, he's going to be super cheap. Had a great year. You know, 30 home runs. For, I know it's Colorado, and I know everybody thinks that I got told on Twitter this week that Nolan Arenado is just a product of Colorado, which I find ridiculous, but so be it. But again, there are options out there. How many that are left to be made? Like you said, there is Wade. Uh, you know, there is Torres. Maybe there's not that many moves that need to be made, but there are possibilities because this team is one or two moves away from really potentially being the AL favorite, if not to win it all this year. All right. Now, talking prospects, Joel Sherman of the New York Post recently reported that Estevan Florial, Gleyber Torres, and Justice Sheffield are all untouchable in trade talks. Uh, I think we agree that's probably a good thing. I'm going to throw out some names of three other prospects, and we've heard all three of these guys floated in potential trade scenarios. Just give me your quick takes on these three guys. We'll go one at a time. Chance Adams, right-handed pitcher. He's 23. I mean, he's the same age as Severino was last year when when Sevy finished third in the in the AL Cy Young Award winner. So I don't know if the if he doesn't get his chance this year, when is he going to get his chance? I mean, the scouting reports on him they don't seem to be as favorable as they were in years past. Scouts are pointing out how he doesn't have that much late break on his high 90s fastball, which I understand major leaguers can hit anything thrown their way if it has no movement on it. So maybe that is a thing. And and reportedly he's still working on his fourth breaking pitch. Got he's got a wicked slider but his curveball is, you know, a little flat at times and needs to be defined. But again, doesn't it sound a lot like Severino was last year? I know Sevy worked with Pedro Martinez, but I just want this guy to have a legit shot before we draw conclusions, uh, you know, and we're ready to just, you know, cast him aside because it seems like if these prospects linger too long in the minor leagues, a la Jabba Chamberlain, a la Phil Hughes, and then, God forbid, you put them in, in the bullpen and you bounce them back and forth for a couple seasons, they're shot because that seemed to be the, the I.O. Of, of the old Yankees. Now, I'm hoping that this new era that we've ushered in is not going to do that. But I'm just not a huge fan of starting guys in, in the bullpen and calling them back and forth. I mean, we've got the same problem that or supposedly a problem that we might put Chad Green in a starting position this year or a chance to at least earn a starting spot in spring, which I think is laughable because he was amazing last year. Uh, I would not want to to any way hurt what's in the bullpen, but that's for manager Boone to decide. All right. How about third baseman Miguel Andujar? Man, he, offensively, he's a young Adrian Beltre. Uh, defensively, he's Adrian Brody. I'm just not. I've watched him. I've seen. I saw him in spring training last year. The guy's been clocked at 96 miles an hour. His arm from across the diamond. I mean, but his accuracy. You just don't know where the ball is going to end up. Um, from what I've read, he was just in the Dominican uh, Winter League. His glove is coming along. He actually only made one error in 18 games. So, you know, I applaud him. I'm, I'm sure he's getting better. I'm sure he knows where he lacks right now. Uh, but I would be shocked if he were to get the opening day nod just because knowing the way Aaron Boone was as a player and listening to the way he speaks, I know he's going to value defense. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, Andhar's just not going to give that to you. And finally, a guy that we got a good look at last year, Clint Frazier. Man, I love Clint. Um, it's, again, it's another guy. It's amazing to me how much his stock has really dropped in less than a year. I mean, this time last year, he was the number two prospect. And all of a sudden, he's a guy that we're really giving no chance to make the 25-man roster out of camp. I know a lot of that's got to do with Ellsbury's contract. But people are so quick to write off Clint as a center fielder. That's exactly what he was in the Indians organization when he was drafted out of high school. And he played there for a couple years. Uh, he was moved, if, if everybody remembers, he was moved because of Dustin Fowler, who, I, man, I was so sad to see him go. 
to the to Oakland, especially you know when he hurt his leg in Chicago was horrible. But that's what Clint was, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, people are saying, "Well, Clint doesn't have any tools to be a center fielder." How would you know? Have you seen him? I mean, I know he hasn't spent much time there, especially the last year. But again, that's because he had to he had to move. Uh, and again, it goes back to as much as I like Aaron Hicks, and I know the organization is super high on him this year. He only played 88 games last year because of multiple oblique injuries. To me, he's got to prove that he can, one, stay healthy, and two, he can stop striking out. I know he's got all the tools. He's got, probably got the best throwing arm for an outfielder in the majors, but there's still a lot there uh, that needs to be proven for me before we're saying, well, this 28-year-old guy who really hasn't played a full year, even with the Twins, we're ready to hand him the center field job. And, and a lot of goes that to Estevan Floreal as well. I I know everybody loves Floreal, especially Cash, but he's 19. He hasn't played above Class A, okay? He strikes out a ton. Go look at those numbers. I know he's getting better, and he, he's looked really good from time to time in Arizona Fall League, and he's getting there. But this kid's 19. He's two years away, at least, from reaching the big. So we got we to gotta pump the brakes a little bit on Floreal before we're ready to, you know, say that he's Hicks's replacement because who knows what's going to happen between now and then. I mean, remember Melky Cabrera? I mean, there's a lot of guys that were supposed to be the next coming of Mickey Mantle or whoever you want to say the next five-tool player is. Um, I'm not ready to claim him as Mike Trout just yet. You've been listening to part one of my interview with Mike Calandrillo of Yanks Go Yard, and you're definitely going to want to hear part two in our next episode when Mike and I talk possible trades, the Jacoby Ellsbury situation, the Red Sox, and the hiring of Aaron Boone. Back in a moment. And now the answer to today's Bronx Bombers trivia question. Whose errant throw did Derek Jeter save on the famous flip play in the 2001 Division Series against the A's? The answer, B. Shane Spencer. And now, here's Joe. All right, this week's Twitter poll results are in. We asked you this. What's the best baseball movie of the last 40 years? Um, So first of all, the three listed options were Major League, which won a close race with 32% of the vote, Field of Dreams in second place at 27%, and right behind was Moneyball with 26. Uh, the fourth option was to reply with your own pick if I hadn't listed it. So for the write-in votes, we had Sandlot with two, Bull Durham with two, The Natural with two, that's a classic, and then one vote each for A League of Their Own, The Rookie, 42, For Love of the Game, Mr. Baseball, and finally Eight Men Out. These are all excellent choices. Personally, I'd have to go with Moneyball. Um, beautifully directed, funny, informative, relevant, uh, great music. And I've always liked stories about people who go against the status quo. Uh, As far as the acting, you know, I'm not the biggest Brad Pitt fan in the world, but in this, I thought he was great. I thought Jonah Hill was great. And of course, the late, great Philip Seymour Hoffman was perfect as Art Howe. Although it's worth pointing out that the real Art Howe disapproved of the film. He said it wasn't accurate. And he has a point. Um, The film shows him refusing to use Chad Bradford out of the bullpen and also refusing to start Scott Hattieberg at first base um, because of bad defense. Neither of those things were actually true. Uh, He used them both. So did the filmmakers take some poetic license in making their points? Yes. Uh, But as far as capturing that tension between this new world of analytics and the old baseball orthodoxy, um, I thought the film captured that incredibly well, just really well done. Uh, Moving on to this week's mailbag, our question of the week here on Bronx Bombers comes from Julio. And by the way, the email is joe at bronxbomberspodcast.com, or you can look us up on Twitter at Bombers Podcast, or on our Facebook page. If you have any questions you want to have us answer on any future episodes, we are more than happy to do so. Uh, But Julio asks, could Giancarlo Stanton and Aaron Judge form the greatest home run hitting pair of all time? Great question, Julio. Uh, The short answer is yes, but let's go a little deeper. Now, the number one and number two single season home run hitting pairs of all time are both Yankees. Uh, The number one pair, of course, is Mantle and Maris back in 1961. Uh, Maris hit 61, Mantle 54 that year for a total of 115. And behind them in the two spot are Ruth and Gehrig on that legendary 1927 team. Ruth hit 60 that year and Gehrig 47. And yes, Ruth and Gehrig did have eight fewer games than Mantle and Maris in 1927. The season was shorter then, but if you extrapolate the Ruth and Gehrig home run pace to the longer season of 162 games, they still fall short of Mantle and Maris by two home runs. So anyway, slice it, Maris and Mantle on top, Ruth and Gehrig right behind. Other all-time great home run hitting pairs would have to be Willie Mays and Willie McCovey on the Giants of the 60s. Um, Ken Griffey Jr. and A-Rod on the Mariners in the mid to late 90s. And let's throw him a bone, Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz on the Red Sox 
who hit 92 combined in 2005. So where do Judge and Stanton fit into all this potentially? Um, well, the good news is we have at least three years to find out. Um, Stanton has an opt-out in his contract, but that isn't until after the 2020 season, and Judge doesn't hit free agency until 2023. And by the way, this whole question about home run pairs doesn't even factor in Gary Sanchez, who hit 33 home runs last season in only 122 games, okay? The guy's a beast. So the reality is we have a trio, not a pair. And if you throw in Bird, you throw in Hicks, you throw in Didi, all those guys have power. Gardner has some power. So there's no question in my mind, Julio, that we'll definitely take a serious run at the team home run record, which is 264 by the 97 Mariners. And we're going to beat it. I mean, we hit 241 last year without Stanton and with Bird out for most of the year. Also, factor in Yankee Stadium has better demand mentions for Stanton than Marlins Park did, okay? According to Baseball Prospectus, Marlins Park was the seventh most difficult home run hitting park for right-handed batters last season, and Yankee Stadium was tied with Camden Yards for second most favorable. So if you adjust Stanton's 2017 results, 59 home runs, using Yankee Stadium in place of Marlins Park, he'd be projected to hit 62 home runs, breaking Maris's record. Uh, now Stanton and Judge in 2017 together totaled 111. That's just four shy of Mantle and Maris. So yes, Julio, assuming everyone stays healthy, two single-season home run records are in serious jeopardy. The tandem record set by Mantle and Maris, and the team record set by the Mariners. And my crystal ball says both those records are going down. All right, so before we wrap up this pilot episode of the Bronx Bombers podcast, we've got a special presentation I think you're going to enjoy. A flashback to a Yankee legend who set a record almost 80 years ago, a record that many, including yours truly, believe will stand for all time. Thursday, May 15th, 1941. In London, government workers repair damage to the House of Commons after a German air raid over the weekend. In Midtown Manhattan, Citizen Kane has just opened at the RKO Palace Theater, and audiences applaud the latest achievement of Orson Welles. But here, in the Bronx, no one's applauding as the fourth place Yankees are on the wrong end of a blowout. In contrast to the White Sox batters who feast on Yankee pitching for 13 runs, the New Yorkers kick away every chance to score except in the first inning, when Phil Rizzuto leads off with a double and Joe DiMaggio, batting cleanup, knocks him in for the Yankees' only run. The team hasn't looked this bad in years, and the 9,040 spectators boo after the final out of each inning. But something else happened that day. A streak was born. DiMaggio's single in the first marked the beginning of a hit streak, during which he would hit 408 with 15 home runs and 55 RBIs, would face four Hall of Fame pitchers including Bob Feller and Lefty Grove, a streak that would continue through the death of Lou Gehrig on June 4th and on through the All-Star Game in July. In St. Louis, the streak almost ends at 35 games. DiMaggio is hitless in the seventh, and Browns manager Luke Sewell orders Bob Muncrief to walk him. Muncrief refuses. Sewell relents. DiMaggio singles. The streak lives on. Cleveland, July 17th. The Yankees, propelled by DiMaggio's hit streak, which stands now at 56 games, sit comfortably in first place, well on their way to their ninth World Series title. DiMaggio and teammate Lefty Gomez enter a cab as they head to Municipal Stadium to face the Indians. Glancing in the rearview mirror, the young cabbie recognizes DiMaggio. Hey Joe, I got a feeling if you don't get a hit your first time up, the streak ends today. Hey, what the hell is this? What are you trying to do, jinx him? The trio proceeds to the ballpark in silence. A pall has been cast on the afternoon. During the game, Indians third baseman Ken Keltner makes great stops on two hard shots by DiMaggio. And in Joe's final at bat, Future Hall of Fame shortstop Lou Boudreaux plays a tricky bounce, and the unlucky DiMaggio hits into a double play. The streak is history. Thirty years later, in a Cleveland hotel lobby, a middle-aged man approaches 57-year-old Joe DiMaggio and makes a confession. Mr. DiMaggio? He was the cabbie who drove Gomez and DiMaggio to the ballpark in Cleveland back in 41. I'm really sorry for what I said that day. He goes on to apologize for his words that day, and Joe feels terrible as it suddenly occurs to him that this man probably spent the last 30 years of his life thinking it was his fault the streak had ended. Anyway, I don't mean to bother you, but I just wanted to apologize. It was all my fault. DiMaggio smiles, shakes the man's hand, and says, No, it wasn't you. 
My number was up, that's all. The Yankee Clipper passed in 1999, but his name is written in the stars, the great DiMaggio. All right, that'll do it for this very first week of Bronx Bombers. Again, don't forget, please subscribe to this podcast, rate and review it, follow us on Twitter at Bombers Podcast, like us on Facebook as well, but most of all, have faith in the Yankees. We'll see you again next week.